We're going to be looking in Acts chapter 16 um, in just a few minutes. But I want to read you a letter I got that was in my mail this morning. There was a young man a couple of years ago that came to church here. Uh, my son was friends with him and invited him. And he came down to the altar on several occasions and asked for prayer. And he had a pending thing in court and he wound up going to jail. And he wrote this letter to me and it, I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, uh, Pastor Dave, hope all is well and that this letter reaches you in good health and spirit. All is well with me just passing my time to come home. I'm writing this letter to see if you can visit for prayer, counsel and any other advice you can offer. And my goal upon release is to find employment and resume going to church and picking up where I left off with family, friends, and my children. And he said, I would like a strong support system. And then he said, I've discussed with Andy, that's my youngest son, about joining the church, and I'm, which I'm still interested in doing. Andy isn't just my friend, he's my brother. And he goes on to talk about how he cares about everybody here and uh, to please get in touch with him. And it would be not really an unusual thing to see that, except this boy was a Muslim. And he said he woke up during the night and God told him, you need to go find answers. And the only friend he had was my son. And Andy said, come on with me. I'll I'll show you some answers. And so don't tell me that God is still not working today and even with Muslims. I think that's awesome. So y'all pray for this young man. I'm not going to mention his name because we're on TV and radio right now. And, and, uh, but just suffice to say, you'll, you'll see him pretty soon as a Christian. All right. That is how... That's what church is supposed to be about. You understand? It's not my four and no more. And so in Acts chapter 16, we're going to look at how the early church operated. Here we see Paul and Silas and others that are ministering in a city of Macedonia called Philippi. And that's where the letter to the Philippians came from. And what you see about to see rather, and we're going to start with verse number, I think it's 13. What you're going to see is a normal day, a normal day in the followers of Christ and those who are part of the church of the living God. And, and you know, the, and, and some of the stuff you're going to read looks strange to you maybe compared to what goes on today, but it wasn't supposed to be like that. It was intended to always be just like the early church. It was intended when the scriptures were written and when Jesus started the church, it was intended for the church to be out there among the people and not just locked in a building and keeping everything a secret. Everybody in here is a missionary. And, you, and, and God intended for you to be out there witnessing and talking about the Lord. It, it was also intended for the church to be bold and to share the gospel and not preach political correctness. Tell it like it really is. That's what people need to hear and to be bold about. Don't apologize for Jesus. Don't apologize. And it was intended for the church to have regular worship and regular prayer as we see here. It was intended for the church to see people regularly getting saved and getting right with God. To exercise, and here it comes, this is scary, to exercise spiritual gifts. And I might add very powerful spiritual gifts that have been given to them by the Holy Spirit. You have them. You may not even know it. You may not even want it, but you got it if you're saved. And then it was intended for the church to be totally led by the Spirit in all that they do. The only reason that we do not see things like this on a wide scale today like we saw here in the book of Acts is there's a lack of commitment on the part of the church. 
Well, Dave, we've got lives to live. We don't have time for that all the time. We don't have time to be coming to church. We got all I mean, it's springtime, folks. My goodness. Lack of dependence solely on the Lord. Well, Dave, we've got plan B. We've even got plan C if it don't work out. That wasn't true with the early church. They had nothing but God. And if God failed them, that was it. How'd you like to live like that? That's scary, ain't it? We all like to have plan B, plan C, but you'll never really have victory until you have none of those. And, and believe this or not, one of the reasons we don't see a lot of miracles happening today is a lack of belief. Now, don't, don't amen me, please, and we'll know who you are. But, but we see the things in the Bible and the stuff that God says can happen, but do we really believe that? Do we really? You know, I, I just saw a three-hour documentary that proved that Moses actually did write the Pentateuch. And they found an ancient Hebrew script that was written around the time of Joseph and not, dec not hundreds of years after Moses died that pretty much cemented it. But what we've been taught by mainstream theologians all these years is that this really, it's a good book to follow, but it's a lot of myths and fairy tales in it. And as a result, the modern church simply don't believe anymore like they should. That's true. And then we've got the fear factor that keeps us from being what God wants us to be because the devil yells and he screams in our ears and we listen to him and we get distracted rather than focusing on the Lord. But let's look for a few minutes at how the first church conducted themselves to maybe we can see what we've been doing wrong and what we need to correct. Luke, the Gentile physician, writes this in verse 13. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spoke unto the women which resorted there. In other words, we see where they went to a, a heaven forbid, a regularly scheduled prayer meeting. They did. They had a regularly scheduled prayer meeting down at the river. They even had that, they had a meeting place. And apparently it was a women's prayer meeting. Let me tell you what prayer can do. Sunday, I went to visit my dad at the nursing home and Donna went with me and I noticed about every 10 steps she couldn't breathe. And it wasn't a cold and it wasn't a flu or anything, something was really wrong with her and I took her early Monday morning to the doctor and they looked really terrified when her EKG came out and they told her you are in AFib and you need to go to the emergency room right now. So I took her and they did a series of tests on her and come to find out she had been in AFib for a long time. That's where half of your heart doesn't work. And that is why she could not get her breath and she couldn't get this. And they were telling all of these procedures that would just scare the devil out of you of what they wanted to do with her. And they had all these doctors and cardiologists and all of them coming in there. And boy, that was tough. And so what I did was I just asked all of the prayer groups, which was thousands of people, to please pray for Donna. I mean, Lord, she's burnt like me. She can't afford to take a day off. But seriously, the second day in the hospital, the doctor finally, the one that was going to make the decisions finally showed up. And he comes walking in the hospital room and he looks all puzzled and he looks all befuddled. And he said, uh, you're not in AFib anymore. It just stopped and fixed itself. They hadn't done anything for her. And, but the Lord did. And... He said, we're not going to do any procedures on you. We're going to send you home. And yesterday, we went for a very long walk, and she did not get winded at all. Y'all keep praying for her. But let me tell you something. Prayer does work. 
That's why we have regularly scheduled prayer meetings in this church because it's not just for our personal edification, it's to see miracles. Verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and that she attended unto the things that were spoken of by Paul. In other words, in the modern English, somebody got saved at a prayer meeting. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So they stayed with Lydia for a while. Now this is a continual story of what's going on in the city. It came to pass as we went to prayer. Here we go again, going to another one of them prayer meetings. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. I love the old English. Man, that's so cool. What it was, was here was someone that was possessed by a demon showed up to the prayer meeting. And, and you start getting fired up for God and you start getting excited for God and serving him, even the lost will start showing up. They will. Here's proof of it. And so here was a slave girl, and she was possessed by a demon spirit, the Bible says that, who was making her masters a lot of money with fortune telling. And I want you to understand that all of that stuff is of Satan. I want you to understand that. All of that stuff, horoscopes, tarot cards, crystals, Ouija boards, all of these things are of Satan and their power, and they do have power. They come from demon spirits, and they are very, very dangerous. So here she followed Paul and us, following them around crying, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show us the way of salvation. I want you to know there are several incidences in the Bible where even a demon spirit would cry out telling the truth once in a while because it was so powerful that even the demons had to back down because they cannot stand against the power of the Holy Spirit. Never, ever, ever can they. And she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I love this, he didn't jump up and down and hoot and holler and scream and yell and do all of these incantations. He just said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. Years ago, Pastor Bowley was witnessing to a young man who was just about that far from accepting Christ, and a Mormon woman come in the room, and she kept... Uh, kept disputing everything that Pastor Bowley said and kept on trying to interfere and finally being grieved, Pastor Bowley said, I command you in the name of Jesus to shut your mouth. And all of a sudden she couldn't talk. She couldn't get a single word out and Pastor Bowley led that boy to the Lord and then after it was over he released her and she stayed mad at him to the day he died because for that time she couldn't talk. Husbands, do not try this at home. <laughs> or you will be like those seven sons of Siva and you're going to flee the house wounded and naked, okay? <laughs> Casting out demons and evil spirits are just something that uh, is not just something for the early church. Do, do, does anybody in here think demons don't exist anymore? If you do, boy, I got some property to sell you. Now, I'll let you have it cheap. What we do, and this is not going to be popular, and I may get a hateful email for this, and I may get a, a hateful phone call for this, but I'm just going to tell you like it is, because I've worked around this for years and years, both as a pastor and in law enforcement. But nowadays, rather than allowing people to seek deliverance from this, we just give them a powerful sedative where the demon will calm down. 
to get real quiet. And, oh, I'm stepping on a sacred cow. Now, I'm not telling you that everybody that suffers from problems like that is demon possessed. Don't get me wrong. And, and if you want to read about that, Dr. James Dobson said there are some people that are organically sick and it causes their mind to do things and they do need genuinely need medicines, but there are a lot of people walking around that don't need anything but an old-fashioned dose of the Holy Ghost. That's all it is. Amen. Demons still exist. And they are even more rampant than ever these days. And they need to be cast out. But be careful. This work was done by spirit-filled Christians who believed and were committed and were walking with the Lord. That's something you better be ready for before you ever attempt to do that. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, cut off the money supply. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. It's all about money, 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 folks. That's all it was. That's all they cared about that girl. She was making them money doing fortune telling. Yeah, that's what it was. And they brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Yeah, I guess so. Telling the truth and cutting out all that foolishness. And they're teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. They were playing on the government there. And, and, and what they were doing, they were playing the bigot and race card, like everybody does today. Nothing has changed, and even the lies are the same that they told back 2,000 years ago. The marketplace was the media of that time, and these wicked people knew how to use it. Oh, oh and by the way, you will not be very popular when you walk closely with the Lord. People hated Christians then, they hate them now. The multitude rose up against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded for them to be beaten. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison and they ordered the jailer to keep them safely. Now that was a whole different ball game back in those days than it is now. If anybody had ever worked in a correctional setting, you, you will know the difference. The, the days are coming, and they already are here in some countries, where you will be beaten and jailed for sharing the gospel. And if the Lord doesn't come and remove his church soon, you will see that in America. We are already the most berated and hated group of people on the planet, even in our own nation that was founded on Christian principles. Now, a lot of people don't want to admit this. A lot of people don't want to believe this. But the United States was founded on Christian principles by many who were Christians. The majority of the founders were Christians. But the church got lazy. The church got really lazy and complacent and refused to take and to control what was rightfully theirs. And let me explain very quickly a few things that were rightfully ours as a church. One of them was our educational system. Lord, have you seen what the gov government has done with our educational system? I don't even want to go there. I, I really don't. Uh, and, and it was rightfully ours. Did you know that the educational system of this country was run by the churches when this country was founded? You went to church to go to school. You did. And then uh, the government was rightfully ours to control. Did you know that all candidates for office in the late 18th century and a lot of the 19th century were screened by the church before they ran? And if the church didn't approve of those people, they weren't going to get elected. Now, if we do approve, they won't get elected. The church has really fallen back. And the welfare system, did you realize that the scriptures tell us that the welfare system belongs to the church to run, but they got greedy and they didn't want to help nobody and give nobody nothing. They wanted to build mansions and empires and so they turned it over to the government to run. But it's the church's duty to take care of the poor. Thank God for what our church is trying to do. Now we have a bunch of young commies coming up that literally worship 
sexual perversion and abortion and know nothing about the freedom and the word of God. I thank God for our young people who do believe and who do make a stand. But I'm telling you, our country is in trouble because the church got lazy. Now let's look at this jailer again in verse 24. They charged him to not to let those people out under any circumstances. And it said, the jailer who having received such a charge thrust those men into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Literally, they were chains. The reason that the jailer under Roman rule, the reason that the jailer put these men in the hole, I, that's what I call that. He put them straight to the hole. Now, you gotta, you got to do a lot in jail to go to the hole nowadays. But they went straight to the hole. That, that's really something. You must really be hated when you get locked up. They don't even put you in population. You go straight to the hole. Okay? The reason he put them in there was that if a prisoner escaped, the jailer had to serve their sentence. No matter what it was. And the jailer was terrified. No doubt he believed that these men would probably be sentenced to death and he didn't want to serve that sentence. And so rather than being daunted by getting locked up, you, you have no idea of the conditions of jails in those days. A dirt floor, no lights, no heating, no cooling. I don't know what kind of food it was. You probably had to eat a rat if you wanted to survive. It was just nasty. And they were not daunted. They were not uh, upset. They turned the jail house into a church house and they praised the Lord and they paid no attention to their circumstances. Oh, if the church would do that for one day, we would turn this world upside down. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. There they were in the hole. They were chained hand and foot, couldn't get up, couldn't move, do anything, and they took that time to sing praises and pray, and it said, and the prisoners heard them. Turned it into a church service. The early church used every single situation to witness. A young man on the outer banks who was getting ready to head to jail got saved and the Lord lit a fire under him and so he just started witnessing to everybody in the jail and started having Bibles brought down and pretty much started a revival in there and the sheriff let him out early because he said it wasn't no need him being up in there anymore. He was stirring up a mess in there doing that. But that's the way the early church used to do. No matter, listen to this, no matter what your situation, God will give you a witness at that hour. Be it bad or be it good, God will give you an opportunity. Use that opportunity. Just like Nick was preaching, you are put there to witness no matter where you are. And I'm glad that Paul and Silas weren't a bunch of whiny little snowflakes drinking their soy and putting their hair up in a man bun. They need a manly ponytail like I got, by golly. Oh, Lord. No, there was no whining. They started a revival in that jail. Kind of like in South Africa, Clifton Bowley was getting ready to make the trip back and he stopped at a KFC, of course he would. And they wound up shutting down the drive through and everybody came up behind the counters. He got Bill Lewis to sing a song while they were in there and they started a church service in a KFC in South Africa. What is that song? Dance, dance, wherever you may be. And that's exactly what that song means. Note that it said, and the prisoners heard them. That's the right kind of witness. They did that. 
not only for their own sake, but to witness while they were there to those prisoners as to the power of God. And it said in verse number 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everybody's bands were loose. That was a supernatural earthquake. A regular earthquake won't do that. It'll just rock the place. But this flung the doors open and the chains fell off of the men that were in there. Do not ever, ever, ever think that God does not know where you are. That don't make no difference where you are. You don't have to come in here to see him or him to see you rather. He knows where you are. This, this elderly pastor's wife died and, and, and uh, at the end of the funeral, somebody walked up and said, Pastor, I'm sorry that you, you lost your wife. And he said, oh, I didn't lose her. I know exactly where she is. God knows where you are. Don't ever, ever think that God does not have a plan. And do not ever think that God can't turn your mess around. There are a lot of you sitting in here because he did. The keepers, the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. The jailer was horrified. He thought that the prisoners had escaped, the doors were open, the chains were loose, and, and, but no one wanted to go anywhere. They all stayed in the jail. Now, how about that? Because they were in the middle of a revival and there was nothing on the street going on that could top what was going on in that jail. That's true. That's a fact. And the jailer thought it better to kill his own self rather than to suffer the fate of what he was going to have to deal with at the hands of the, of the Roman soldiers. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Wow. Wow. I bet he could hardly believe his ears. He had that sword drawn and was getting ready to thrust it in his heart. And he heard Paul say, don't hurt yourself. We're here. We're all here. No doubt Paul heard the jailer and sensed his fear and the agony and he knew what was going on. And so the jailer called for a light. That's how it was dark in there. And he sprang in and came trembling. And he fell down before Paul and Silas, the inmate. Here's the jailer falling down before the inmate. The jail was dark and foreboding, but the light of the gospel was still there. And he brought them out. And here was his question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow. Did you hear that? Even the jailer heard them singing and praising and testifying. The jailer heard the gospel too. And Paul and Silas had proved to him that they were the real thing. And they didn't run. They decided to stay. So that jailer, at his moment of truth, he wanted what they had even though they were in the hole, even though they were bound hand and foot, he wanted what they had. Listen to how simple this is. You ask somebody how to get saved, oh, what, what, well, you know, first of all, we gotta uh, uh, do this, we gotta do that, then you gotta go see the preacher, and then he's gonna have to determine whether or not, mm-mm, mm-mm. Listen to this. Paul said, and they said rather, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house.